Good morning. I um, apologize. I will not be standing uh, this morning. I, I mess up my foot, and the doctor wants me to wear a boot for the next couple of months. So, and if you ever had one of those, you know it's extremely uncomfortable to stand with a boot on. It, you know, my hip hurts. It's just keeping my balance straight. So, if it's okay with you guys, I'm gonna sit like you guys sitting. So. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to uh, worship on Sunday morning, a time that I believe is so precious uh, for all disciples of Christ. After a week where many of us have been beat down, torn apart with all different things happening in life, and we get to reflect and we get to spend time together in our worship uh, towards our Savior, our Almighty God. Uh, before I start, uh, I want to reiterate that we will be hosting our first Q&A night for um, uh, the year, this year, 2021. It will be Friday at 7 p.m. Join us on Zoom. You know, I have a couple of questions I want to discuss with you guys. And, and this platform, uh, we started it as a way for us to have biblical interactions. You know, and I really, 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 really love talking Bible, y'all. I really do. You know, so whatever questions you have, I don't know it all. And I think the more I get questions from people, the more I get to learn. So if you guys have any questions, email them to me. No question is too small. And if I don't know the answer, I'll be honest with you. I don't know the answer. You know, so if you have any questions, email them to me and join us for an hour um, or an hour and a half, who knows, um, Friday night at 7 p.m., on Zoom. It will be fun, it will be live, and uh, it will be quite a good interaction. This morning, we are going to talk about the birth of the church. Um, I know I can't stand for long, but if you guys don't mind, I, I don't want to break our tradition. I'd like for you guys to join me, uh, if you are physically able, <laughs> and stand with me for the re reading of God's holy word. Acts chapter 2, verse number 36 through 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucify, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every single one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. Let me read that again. Those who accepted the gospel were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Pray with me. Father God, I humble myself this morning, knowing that you are present among us always. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit guiding us, teaching us, encouraging us. And Father, I pray that we as a church, we will fight every day to abide within the confine of Scripture. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. And I will sit down as well. So this morning, before we start, I want to let you guys know this is more like a Bible class format. I really miss teaching here in this auditorium. So I thought, why not just have a Bible study? You know, I mean, you know, what's the difference between preaching and teaching anyway? When you read scripture, the Bible, one of Jesus' many, many reputations was that he was known to be a good teacher, not a good preacher. Not that he wasn't. You should read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. By the way, that was a long sermon. You guys get what I'm saying? But he was a good teacher. So I want to teach 
on the birth of the church. It is a topic that is quite interesting to me. And I think it's important for us to understand the origin of the assembly of God, the assembling of disciples of Christ. Let's start with this. In the book of Acts, if you want to learn about the origin of the church, the origin of the body of Christ, the first place you need to go, it's in the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts, it records the birth and the history of the church through the works of the apostles and the Holy Spirit. It's very important for us to understand nothing that was done about the church was done without the Holy Spirit. And I still believe today we cannot have church without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must always be present. Church, the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, pretty much anywhere you go in the religious world, it is generally accepted as the narrative of the birth of the church. Pretty much everyone, no matter their denominational background, believes Acts chapter 2, that's where you go to understand the birth of the church. However, before we talk about the birth of the church, we need to understand, we need to basically have a basic understanding of the series of events that led to the birth of the church. Think, for example, when somebody's being born. For those of you who are married and have kids, a lot of times it's not really up to you, and sometimes people make the decision to have children or not have children. There's a series of events that led to Andre being born. And that's what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> now, here's what I'm saying. We need to understand the design and the conception of the church before we can fully appreciate the birth of the church. The first thing we have to understand about that is that the church, it was designed and conceived in the mind of God. The church is not a human concept. The church did not start because a group of people got together, they decided they were going to build something, a building, or whatever, and start worshiping God. No, the church was designed and conceived in the mind of God. For us to really understand that, we have to understand the same thing with human beings. Us, human beings, we are designed and conceived in the mind of God before we were even born. I know your parents made the decision to have you, or whatever it is. But it was God who designed you and I. God designed every single person on this planet. And there are verses in the Bible to help us understand the design and conception of mankind in the mind of God. This verse is not in there, but if you read in the book of Genesis, Chapter 1, and Lord, I pray you can find the book of Genesis in your Bible. The Bible says we are created in the image of God. That's the first thing we need to understand. And in Psalm chapter 39, 139, listen to what the, uh, David said. For you, talking about God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. David says God woven me together, pieced me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I've read at least a couple of books titled Being Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. No matter your race, no matter your ethnicity, no matter how tall, short you are, no matter what you look like, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. David said, your works are wonderful. I know that very well. You watched me as I was born, as I was being formed. David said, God, you watched me as I was being formed, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. 
God had an idea. God knew exactly how he wanted to create us, me, before I was born. God wanted to create me tall, dark, and handsome. So he created me like that. God wanted to create you how he created you. So he created you like that. And what's beautiful about this text, David said, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every single day of your life. God knew whatever happened in your life, he knew it was going to happen. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Praise God, that's beautiful. Nothing in your life happened outside of the knowledge of God. Now, this is not to say God is the author of evil. This is to say God knew it was going to happen. And in the end, God knows how to work bad things together for your good. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, the writer says, before I, before I, God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God knew every single one of you before you were even formed inside of your mom's belly. The same concept apply for the church. Think about it. Just like us human beings, the church was designed and conceived in the mind of God. I know we always go back to Acts chapter 2 to understand the events that led to the church being born. But the truth is the church was designed and conceived in the mind of God. And guess, guess this. The church was designed to look a certain way. God designed you, he designed me to look a certain way. The church was designed to look a specific way. And the church was also designed for a specific purpose. Anything created needs to ask its creator, why am I here for? We were created by God. God is the creator. He needs to let us know why we are here for. We as a church was designed and conceived in the mind of God. So we as a church need to ask God why we are here for. And guess what? God left us a manual right here for us to know and understand the ins and outs of the church, our purpose as, as a church. So design, being designed and conceived in the mind of God, the church was carefully and I mean that carefully designed way before Acts chapter 2 to be God's dwelling place. Now I know we all have a specific understanding what is church or why we are here. And I'm not saying you are wrong. You know, church is about worship. Church is about praise. It's about praying God. It's about fellowshipping. It's about being together. It's about interacting with one another and interacting with God. But I sincerely believe when you follow God's idea in the Bible from the Old Testament, you will see that God's primary purpose for the church is to be his dwelling place. When you think of the term dwelling place, it's not new to the church. It started all the way back in the book of Exodus. And some of you already know where I'm heading with this. It started with the tabernacle of God. After the nation of Israel left Egypt, while they were in the wilderness, God told Moses in Exodus chapter 25, I want you to build me a tabernacle so that I may dwell among my people. And every time God said, build it according to the pattern that I will show you. That's very important. The tabernacle of God was built according to God's specific instructions. That is very important to remember. If you read in Exodus 25, verse number 8 and 9, then have them make me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnish furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. God had a specific design and purpose in mind for his tabernacle. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to see what happened in the tabernacle. I want to remind you what happened in the tabernacle when people were worshiping. The Bible says the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down on it and the glory of God filled that place. 
There's something about God in clouds. If you research that in the Bible, you'll see several times on Mount Sinai with Moses when they were in the wilderness. Jesus Christ, the Mount of Transfiguration. God so many times appeared in the form of cloud, the Bible says. The presence of God among his people. That's why the tabernacle was built. So that God could dwell among his people. Then, we need to remember, by the time they traveled through the wilderness, yes, they spent 40 days wandering in the wilderness because they choose to disobey God's command in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and chapter 2. But eventually they made it to the promised land, and God had them build a more permanent dwelling called the temple of God. Unlike the tabernacle, which was a temporary, movable facility, the temple of God is more permanent. It's a more permanent structure built by Solomon in Jerusalem. There are those who believe the Western Wall currently in Jerusalem is a remnant of that temple, more like the Herodian Temple. But that temple that was built, the original, the OG Temple of God, that temple was destroyed. But we need to understand it was built, again, according to God's specific instructions. Read your Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and through 7, or 1 Kings 5 and 6, detailed instructions. God tell them from what kind of wood, what kind of gold, and you know where to put this table. That detailed instructions. God gave them as to how he wanted them to build his temple. As I said, the temple was built specifically for a purpose. It was designed in the mind of God for a specific purpose. In 1 Kings chapter 8, the Bible says when the priest came out, to the holy place, look at this, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. Again, the temple was built to be God's dwelling place. It was so important to the nation of Israel that in 1 Kings chapter 11, towards the last two verses, after the death of Solomon, the temple was divided, I mean, the nation of Israel was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Rehoboam, the son of Saul, King Saul, was the leader of the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom, called Judah, that's where Jerusalem was. That's where the temple of God was built. Jeroboam, who was a servant of Saul, revolted against Rehoboam. Read your Bible in 1 Kings chapter 12. So he decided he was going to lead in the northern kingdom. While he was leading in the northern kingdom, people needed to worship. People said, how are we going to worship? We have to go to the temple. So they started to travel hundreds of miles to go to the temple in the southern kingdom in Jerusalem. So King Jeroboam thought to himself, if I allow my people to go to worship in Jerusalem in the temple where the, tem where the presence of God was, then they're going to say, hey, Rehoboam can be the leader of the entire kingdom. And he decided, I can't let that happen. So Jeroboam decided he would build golden calves right along the border. Hey, he said, here are your gods. Don't go down to Jerusalem. Don't go to the temple of God. But the Jewish people understood, if I needed to worship God, I needed to be where God was. And God was where? In the temple of God. Because it was built to be God's dwelling place. And yes, unfortunately, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 2 Kings chapter 25, King Nebuchadnezzar. And the temple eventually was rebuilt. We talked about that before under the leadership of Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, and Ezra. And King Herod re uh, renovated the temple, designed it on a larger scale in the New Testament. When Jesus Christ came to be in the New Testament, everyone knew that temple as the Herodian temple. But that's where the Jewish people went to worship. It doesn't matter how many times Gentiles try to come. They divided that temple with walls. There was a court for women. There was a court for Gentiles. Only the Jews were allowed close to God, closer to the Holy of Holies. Brothers and sisters, God always, always had a plan to manifest his presence among his people. 
Since the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, you remember when uh, Adam and Eve sinned? The Bible says God came down and walked. I wonder what that felt like. And walked in the garden and talked to Adam and Eve. Because he wanted his presence to be manifested among his people. And then the tabernacle, the ark, the temple. Because it's important to God for us to know he's present among us. And after the temple was destroyed, eventually, by the Romans in 70 AD, and even before that, the church was birthed, which led us to the church of God. From the tabernacle of God to the temple of God, and now the church. The church was built by Jesus Christ himself. Let's get that clear. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 18, the Bible says, Jesus said as a response to Peter, I will build whose church? My church. Not Baptist's, not Donnie's, not Jeremy's, not Sandstone's, nobody but my church. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Who's that rock? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The purpose of the church was for God to dwell among his people. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 21 and 22, listen to what Paul says. We are what? Carefully being joined together in whom? In Jesus Christ. Becoming what? A holy temple for the Lord. That's what we are today. We are a holy temple where God dwells. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by the Spirit. Now, let me say something here. This might be shocking to some of you, and I hope it's not to most of you. It is absolutely unbiblical to call the auditorium of a building the sanctuary. Let me repeat that again. It is biblically inaccurate to call the auditorium, like this place, to call it the sanctuary. When I read my Bible, this place is not the sanctuary, folks. We are the sanctuary of God. We cannot think that, oh, when we come in here, and we should be, we need to dress our best. We cannot use certain words when we come in this building, and we shouldn't. We cannot talk a certain way, walk a certain way. We would dare not listen to some songs in this building. Oh, God forbid if I watch certain videos in this building. Because it's like for some reason we think the Spirit of God lives in the walls of this building. This building is not holy. We are. We, you and I are. If you think you can do it in this building, don't do it at home. Because God dwells in you. If you guys read the Old Testament, you will see how much reverence the Jewish people had when they were in the temple of God. They worship with their face flat to the ground because this is the presence of God. It's a holy place. We are holy. God lives in us. That's the beauty of the church. God designed it to be different this time. And we have to understand that. We have to believe that. If you wouldn't wear it here, don't wear it at work. Because we are the sanctuary. I said I wasn't going to preach. Let me just get back to my teaching points. <laughs> Unlike the tabernacle and the temple of God, the church was designed to be a living organism not bound by walls. In the book of Acts, the Bible says, God does no longer lives in building bills with hands. God lives in us. The church was designed to be a community, this is important, for everyone to belong. Unlike the tabernacle and the temple, where only the Jewish people were, God wanted to build a place where everybody could belong. You need to remember, in Acts chapter 1, they asked Jesus' question after the resurrection, right before the ascension, verse number 8. Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said, it is not for you to know the time. Oh yeah, Jesus was going to restore his kingdom, all right. But Jesus was going to restore a kingdom where everybody was welcome. That was designed in the mind of God. 
God designed the church to be more inclusive, unlike the temple of God. Let me explain. Look at your Bible in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 12 and 13. Paul says, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. Who is he talking about? Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? We be Gentiles. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You are what? Excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel. When you think about what God did for you and I, the more I read scripture, the more I am in love with my God. Do I, the more I am in awe of who God is. And, and I don't think I even comprehend a tenth of who God really is. The next verse is verse 13. But now, oh, I love those two words. <laughs> when you read your Bible, you see those words, but now, or but God. Remember what I said? It's divine intervention. Something was impossible, but God had to intervene. Oh, I know in the temple it was all about the Jewish people, but now you have been united. You have been included. You have been invited. Once you were far away, there were walls that separated you. Walls of whatever, for whatever reason. But now, you were far away from God. But now, you have been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why we can be here with all sort of people from all sort of walk of life, all sort of racial background. Because God designed the church to be a place where everyone can be welcome. In Galatians chapter 3, verse number 28, Paul reiterated to those uh, folks in the church in Galatia, Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. That's racial. There is neither slave nor free. That's social and economic class. There is neither male nor female. That's gender differences. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Why? But God. He had an original design and specific purpose for the church. The church was not an afterthought, God, guys. It was carefully designed and planned in the mind of God. God didn't sit in heaven and say, oh, I, or, uh, 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 Michael, come here. What am I going to do? How am I going to save these people, Michael? I try to send kings and prophets and judges and they're still not listening. Michael, do you have any idea? Call Gabriel. Gabriel, you got any idea? No. God always knew. Ever since the dawn of time, he was going to create a new community where everyone could belong. That is why God is called an omniscient God. He knows everything and he has a plan for everything. In Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4 and 5, listen to what Paul says. At the right time, at the right time, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, Subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who are slaves to the law at the right time. God is a God who works in a timely manner, folks. When you read scripture in Galatians 4, as we just read, Christ was born at the right time. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 6, the Bible says, at just the right time, while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. At just the right time, Jesus Christ will come back. God works in a timely manner. We don't know what that time is. God does. We talked about that last Sunday. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, our job is to be ready at all times. Because that time is known to God. It is unexpected to us. And I believe the church was born at the right time. It was born in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50 days after the Passover. And Jesus Christ spent 40 days. Jesus Christ died on Passover. He spent 40 days with his people. And we're going to talk about why. 40 days. He ascended. And Jesus Christ says, wait in Jerusalem. You will receive the Holy Spirit. They had to wait 10 days. And then the church was born. So now that we understand the church was designed and conceived in the mind of God. It's important to understand the preparation for the birth of the church. Let's go back to this analogy. We all know our human beings are conceived. 
You don't know, ask your mom. Um, when my wife was pregnant and we knew she was pregnant, we had to prepare, right? You have to set certain things. Uh, we, you will never be fully prepared for a child. You know, you, you, you don't really know what their attitude behavior is going to be like. God knitted Andre together, you know, with everything he does that makes me happy, everything he does that frustrates me. I have to look at him. I'm like, this is a child of God. I got to love this child. I remember we had to be prepared, preparing a room, putting crib together, fell on my toe, broke my nail. Like, we had to be prepared. Listen, God had to prepare the way for the birth of the church. He did not only do that with John the Baptist, but he did that with the apostles. You cannot talk about the church and not talk about the works of the apostles. Jesus intentionally selected the 12 apostles for a specific purpose. It wasn't by chance. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, Jesus went on a mountain to pray. The Bible doesn't say what he was praying about. But right after that, the Bible says he came down and selected 12 apostles. What do you think he was praying about? I think that's what he was praying. He selected those 12 apostles, right? He was teaching them and preparing them to continue his work after his departure. Over and over in the gospel, you will see the writer says it was not his time yet. Or Jesus Christ would do a miracle. Read Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 2. He would do a miracle. He says, go home. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell folks what I'm doing. Why? Because Jesus wasn't ready to die just yet. It wasn't the right time. Jesus needed time to prepare his apostles for the work he wanted them to do. To teach them. To groom them. To give them the Holy Spirit. He was preparing them for the work they were about to do. It wasn't until the triumphal entry in Jerusalem that Jesus says, I'm ready. Go ahead, all of y'all, scream from the top of your lungs. Tell them who I am because I'm ready. I know these religious leaders have been looking to kill me. I know the Romans have been looking to get rid of me. But Jesus knew he's done his job and he was ready to ascend. Leaving that region to travel through Galilee, Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples to teach them. He was getting them ready. That's why he chose the apostles. Beside Jesus' apostle, the second things we have to consider, especially in Acts chapter 1, you need to think of Jesus' appearances. Jesus died, right? He was resurrected. The stone rolled away. He wasn't in the tomb. Jesus could have easily just went up into heaven. He already taught his disciples. Why did he spend 40 days appearing, popping up here and there? These people are behind closed door. Poof, here comes Jesus. Why do you think he did all that? He has a specific purpose. There's a specific design for everything God does. Praise God. God is in the details, y'all. We don't understand it sometimes, but he's in the details. In Acts chapter 1, until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them what? Many convincing proofs that he was alive. Many convincing proofs. Jesus Christ first appeared to Mary Magdalene, Mark 16, 9, John chapter 20. When Mary Magdalene was there, the stone rolled away. She ran back to the apostles. Uh, I believe Peter and John were together. The Bible says Peter and another apostles. I believe it was John. The Bible says Peter started running, but the other apostle outran Peter. I don't know why, but Peter didn't get there first. John got to the tomb. John looked inside, but he didn't go in. When Peter got there, he went inside and saw the linen. Jesus was wrapped in, and he thought about what had happened, and he went back to the other apostles. Mary Magdalene stayed behind. Two angels showed up. They talked to Mary. They left. And then Jesus showed up. But Mary did not know it was Jesus. Mary said, are you the gardener? Did you take away his body? Show me where he is. I just want to see the dead body of my Savior. And Jesus says, Mary, at that moment, Jesus is talking to her. But it's when Jesus pronounced her name. That's when she knew it was Jesus. 
And Jesus says, don't touch me. I am yet to ascend to my father in heaven. Go tell everybody else. It was a woman who first went into, uh, into the towns and telling people about the resurrected Savior. It was Mary. It was Joanna. It was Mary, the mother of James. It was then. Not only he appeared to Mary Magdalene, he also appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Read Luke chapter 24. One of them, his name was Cleopas. Jesus was walking with them all the way to their final destination. They did not know who Jesus Christ was. And Mark says in Mark 16, verse number 12, Jesus appeared to them in a different form. What is that form? I don't know. But the Bible says in Luke 24, when Jesus sat down with Cleopas and that other disciple and started to break bread with them, they remember, this must be Jesus. Jesus was like, yep, poof, he was gone. Talking about, you know, superpowers? <laughs> that was Jesus. And then Jesus appeared to the ten apostles. After he appeared to the ten apostles, he appeared to the eleven because John, I mean, Thomas wasn't there. The Bible says when he appeared to the ten, Thomas wasn't there. And then when they went to Thomas and says, Thomas, we've seen Jesus. He's alive. And they are like, Thomas was said what? Unless I see him for myself. Unless I can see the marks on his head. Unless I can touch his hands and see his size. I will not believe. Poof, here comes Jesus. Praise God, Jesus is awesome. And Jesus showed up and said, Thomas, here I am. Touch my sides. Touch my hands. Here I am. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. My Lord, my God. And Jesus told him why. Blessed is he who believed and has yet seen. We have not seen Jesus physically, guys, but we believe. We believe. I believe without a shadow of a doubt. I'm at a point in my faith, I, like, I don't, oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm getting excited. Let me get back to my teaching voice. So after Jesus appeared to the 10 apostles, the 11 apostles, then Jesus Christ took the time, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, to appear to more than 500 people. Do you know why? Because Jesus wanted to make sure they had convincing proofs that he was and is alive. Church, we do not worship a dead savior. There's a lot of religion out there that are built after men who have died and stayed buried in their tomb. But we worship a savior who died and was buried and rose again. That is the difference maker. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is why we are here. And if Jesus Christ did not appear, if he didn't show up, remember in Matthew chapter 28, when the guards who were guarding the tomb they saw what had happened. They went to the chief priest. They explained everything that happened. The chief priest said, what? Hey, we're going to give you some money. Tell everybody. They stole the body. And if Jesus didn't appear, and there's no one has seen the body, then they would have believed, yep, you guys stole the body. But no one can say that because everyone, well, not everyone, most people in Palestine saw Jesus with their own eyes after he died. What's more importantly, church, if Christ had not been raised from the dead, what are you doing here? If you don't believe the resurrection happened, why are we here? That is how the church was born. That's why he prepared his apostles. That's why he had to appear. And more importantly, he had to give specific instructions. Remember, specific instructions in the temple, specific instructions to build the tabernacle, specific instructions for the church to be born. Stay in Jerusalem. Wait for the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit is very important in the birth of the church and how the church functions today. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is called our advocate. It is called our helper. It is called our counselor. It is called our comforter, our intercessor. And it is our identity. That's how we will make it to heaven because we have the Holy Spirit which was received after baptism. Jesus had to empower them with the resources they needed to establish his church. 
Jesus, God, is not going to call you to something and not empower you and not give you the resources you need to go through it. That's who God is. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 20, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. The writer is saying, remember, God rose Jesus from the dead. So what is it that you think that God cannot equip you with to do his will? Church, God can equip us with anything we need to do his will. Beside the apostles, the appearances, and the instructions he provided, the church couldn't start until Jesus Christ ascended. His ascension indicated the end point of his ministry and the beginning of the apostles' ministry. That's what his ascension indicated. Jesus, not only that, Jesus had to ascend so that the Holy Spirit could descend. Because Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse number 7, Very truly I tell you, it is very important that I go away. Unless I go away, the advocate, who is also Jesus Christ, read 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1. Jesus is called our advocate. The advocate will not come unless I ascend. Jesus had to ascend so that the Holy Spirit could descend. Let's bring this all to a conclusion for now. The church was born because the Holy Spirit came down. The church was born because the word of God was preached. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says after they received the Holy Spirit, they started to speak in tongues. We'll talk about that. And the Bible says some people in the audience, some people say, hey, we understand in our own language. What did he accuse the apostles of? These guys must be drunk. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they thought they were drunk. And Peter and the 11 stood up. Not 120 as in Acts chapter 1. Because it was Peter and the 11 who were what? Baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, stay in Jerusalem and you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Which only happens once, by the way. Peter preached what I believe to be the first gospel sermon. And after that, there was a desire to obey the word of God. People say, hey, we believe. What shall we do? We believe. What shall we do? Do you guys believe in God? Talk back to him. Talk, talk back. Do you guys believe in God? Now, the question you need to ask is what shall we do? Those of you watching at home, can you see my eyes from the camera? Do you guys believe in God? The question you need to ask is what shall we do? And let me tell you exactly what you shall do. Because this was the first time people knew exactly what they needed to do to be part of the body of Christ. They were baptized for the remission of their sin. That's what Peter said. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know what you should do to belong to the body of Christ, not this building, but the real body of Christ, the sanctuary, be baptized for the remission of sin. And the church was born. What about the church of Christ? The church was born to withstand the test of time. The church has been through a lot. Many men have tried to get rid of the church. <laughs> Y'all don't know what you're up to. The church survived cultural trends. The church survived historical periods. The church survived a lot. And guess what? The church is the most powerful living organism on the planet. We will die. Nations will, nations will disappear. I don't know. The church will live until Jesus Christ comes back. Am I worried about the church? No, I'm not. You know why? Because God, Jesus is the head of the church and he knows what he's doing. And I'm asking you to join this church, to join this community of believers who believe that Jesus was born, Jesus died, Jesus was resurrected, and he will come back to bring you home. If that's what you like to do, please come forward, call us, email us. We'll make sure 
You belong to the church body. Let's all stand and sing together.